part of the, the talk. I want to talk about some figures that are unusual and novel that have been found in the world of psychology, which you may take away and find quite useful. Before I start, has anybody actually heard of the phrase sensory specific satiety? Yeah? So it's, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a bucket to say when you know uh, your mouth is dry. Uh, sensory specific satiety. It's an interesting phenomenon because what it suggests is this, that the satiety that you feel is dependent on the sensory properties of the food. <coughs> so it's not the pleasantness, it's the satiety that you feel. And what experimenters have done is they've demonstrated, for example, that if you, say, um, have a plate of sausages and you told to eat as many sausages as you want, or you give them sausages, eggs, bacon, sausages, uh, tomatoes and so on, people will eat more of the varied meal than the plate of sausages. And obviously then when they're given uh, the foods to rate afterwards, they rate sausages as being less pleasant than it was before they started eating them. But the ratings of the other foods tend to stay fairly stable. So the satiety here was actually specific to the sensory property of the food. In this case, a particular type of food. But it doesn't end there because now it gets more interesting. Because the phenomenon also extends to food shape and colour. And there was an experiment <coughs> where, the, uh, where the participants were actually asked to eat either one shape of pasta or three shapes of pasta. <laughs> and what happened was this, as you might predict now, is that people ate more of the three types than the one type of pasta. <laughs> then they did another experiment where they changed the sandwich filling. So they had one sandwich filling or three sandwich fillings. As you might now predict, people ate more of the variety of sandwiches than they did of the single sandwich. And then they did it with Smarties. And they presented other single colour Smarties and differently coloured Smarties. And guess what happened? Of course, people had more of the differently coloured Smarties than of the single coloured Smarties. There is a lesson here, ladies and gentlemen, for your dinner party. And that is, in these cash strap times, one type of pasta, one type of sandwich filling, and one type of Smarties for dessert. Um, should I keep your budget under control? <laughs> <laughs> and it also extends to smell uh, as well. Uh, if, if you eat, say, bananas to satiety and then you smell a banana afterwards, then your pleasantness rating of that smell uh, would be lower than it was before you started eating the banana. But the ratings, the pleasantness ratings for other foods will again stay fairly stable for foods that have not been eaten. So again, there, the sensory specific um, aspect is olfactory. And the interesting thing about sensory specific satiety is that it seems to be mediated by one part of the brain. And this slide here actually shows you the regions of the brain that we know are involved in the perception of taste. There's taste area one here, which is responsible for the um, sensory um, experience of food. So this is the brain simply responding to what's in your mouth and perceiving that it, there is something that it's ingested and um, it's picking up the saltiness, the bitterness, the umami, and so on and so on. However, there is another part, very close to it, called taste area 2, which seems to mediate our hedonic response to food. So as our pleasantness uh, rating of the food declines over the course of eating, which it does normally, then activation here also declines. And then if we start eating the food that we actually quite like, that area becomes more active again. Activation in this area, though, stays fairly stable because the brain is still responding to sensory stimulation. <coughs> and this part of the brain, interestingly, seems to be the uh, brain analogue of our pleasantness response. And it happens to chocolate, it happens to fat, it happens to all sorts of foods where you do get this reduction in this particular area when a person eats a food to satiate. Uh, very famously, there was a study by uh, Small, an American psychologist called Small, a few years ago, uh, where he asked individuals to eat chocolate, as much chocolate as they wanted, and monitored their brain activation, and found exactly this pattern. There was a reduction in this part of the brain. There are certain aspects of the restaurant environment that affect our behaviour, and as a psychologist, I'm interested in what factors influence behaviour. And everything I'm about to show you now has actually been reported in the literature. So this is not survey work, it's not anecdote, this is based on actual uh, data. 
So, for example, we know that exposure to classical music increases the sales of expensive wines. And not just that, if you're at a restaurant, a high-end restaurant, an expensive restaurant, playing classical music, you will actually spend more in that restaurant if there's classical music playing. There was an experiment done quite a few years ago <coughs> by another psychologist called Adrian North, who found that if you played um, French accordion music down the wine aisle, that people bought more French wine. Whereas if you play beer keller music, people bought more German wine. Uh, and then the participants were asked afterwards, why did you choose the wine that you did? None of them mentioned the music. <laughs> so it shows you how unconscious these, uh, these effects can be. Another study found that um, Italian music, the presence of Italian music, again increased the consumption of Italian and Mexican food. But interestingly, the exposure to Mexican type music didn't increase the consumption of Mexican food. <laughs> and of course the tempo, the volume of the music, is also very important because that does have rather peculiar effects on your behaviour and you may not realise that it, that it does. For example, if there's slow music <coughs> in a restaurant, people actually spend longer in it if it's a high quality restaurant, but it takes you longer to be served. On average, about two minutes longer to be served. We also underestimate the time that we spend in a restaurant that plays slow music, and we overestimate the time that we spend when the music is fast. And normally, if there's fast music present, we take about 4.4 bumps per minute. 3583 if it's slow, and 3.23 if there's no music playing at all. Also, um, there have been some experiments with um, uh, on music and its effects on drinking, uh, soft drink drinking. And it's been found that the the noisier the music, and it's pop music, then the more uh, of this soft drink people will consume. This is obviously done with you know, fairly young students. And also the, the scent of the environment also influences your behaviour. Less work on this, but there is some work on it. Um, for example, we know that scent allows us to recall unfamiliar brands. Um, but we also know um, that it plays a role in our acceptance of brands. There was one experiment that asked people to rate the effectiveness of either a suntan lotion or a detergent. But the detergent was, was either scented with um, pine or coconut, and then the suntan oil was scented with the same aromas. When the detergent was scented with pine, it was rated to be very effective. And if the suntan lotion was scented with coconut, rated very effective. When the odors were switched, they were regarded as being less effective. Well, the products were exactly the same. The only thing that differed was the scent, because we tend to associate detergents with, you know, alpine freshness and all that malarkey, whereas um, we associate suntan lotion with the smell of coconut, because most suntan lotions tend to be scented in that way. And so we seem to have been conditioned, trained, to expect these sorts of um, smells. So smell affects our behaviour in a very peculiar way. When the music and the odour match, that is, uh, the room is still with very fast music and you can smell something quite zesty, um, then the shops are rated more positively. People think they spend less time in shops that are scented, but actually they do spend more time in them. They don't necessarily buy more, but they spend more time in the shops. And we know now that there was one study that compared how much people spent in a restaurant that was scented with lemon um, or lavender, and people spent longer and spent more money in the restaurant that was lavender scented versus one that was lemon scent. And also, there was an experiment showing that geranium, um, the odour of geranium, increased the length of social interaction between strangers as well, suggesting that um, <coughs> odour, a bit like the tea that was mentioned earlier, can break down these uh, social barriers. Interesting, on the subject of tea, it was interesting what Cyrus was saying earlier about the warmth of the, the, the cup. And the gentleman from uh, Lancashire, I think, I uh, was mentioning that it was used as a form of social glue. There was an experiment done a couple of years ago that found that simply holding a cup of hot beverage actually made, made you rate the person you were talking to as being warmer than if you didn't have hot beverage. <laughs> so these little things, you know, these little epiphenomena, you think, seem to have quite interesting effects in our behaviour that we don't uh, realise. <laughs> should you die alone <coughs> or should you die with others? If you're worried about your money, I would dine alone if I were you. And also if you're worried about your waistline, I would definitely dine alone because 
The research suggests that you eat more when you're with others, and you also consume more alcohol as well. If the person you're with eats quickly, so do you. There seems to be some sort of mirroring behavior that goes on. There was one experiment that involved um, exposing people to a man or a woman who ate biscuits very quickly or very slowly. And the participant also had to eat biscuits as well. In that experiment, it was found that the fast biscuit eating man, but not the woman, <laughs> led to faster eating in the men and the women. So, if you're with a man who's eating biscuits very quickly, <laughs> <laughs> also over the weekends, here we are over the weekend, uh, meals tend to be around 12% larger. Um, they also contain more macronutrients, like the bad things. Um, like fats and carbohydrates and alcohol as well. And interestingly, if you join alone, you spend around 36 minutes in a restaurant, whereas if you're in a group, you spend around 50. So the capacity there for actually eating more may be lengthened because of the group that you're in. And also, the meals you and your family, your spouse, they tend to be larger and faster, but with your friends, they tend to be larger and slower. So they, they're both bigger than if you ate alone. And with one, um, you're much quicker at doing it, and in the other context, you're not slow. An interesting look, I put it at the bottom, it's actually quite important. Um, you also consume more calories if you consume as a group than if you ate alone. On average, around 212 uh, calories. So we have a summary message to quite a few of us here. So these are some of the things that you may not realize can affect um, your behavior and your, your food um, consumption. Just to finish off, um, this is, these are some of the things that we actually do at the, uh, the Human Faction Lab um, at the university. So it gives you an idea of the sort of things uh, that we do. Um, there's no photograph of me because they look a lot more prepossessing than I do, which is why they're there. Um, and I'd like to finish off actually by, um, well I've talked a lot about the sense of smell and how important it is, and the functions of smell. And the third or fourth slide I had showed you the functions of smell that we think it performs. Um, however, I think the, the possibly the, the best um, use of smell is actually in the next slide that I'm about to show you, which is uh, an advertisement uh, for a particular perfume that was seen on a, um, a bus shelter hoarding um, a few weeks ago, uh, so a few years ago, which I took a photograph of. Um, and it's of the first Australian perfume, Sheila, which also kills one. <laughs> 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 